Huh. Well, this morning we're privileged to have Brother James Kimbrell with us and Amen. Sister Selena and uh, Jax. We're so glad that they're here this morning. Brother James is going to preach for us this morning. Uh, I would like for you and uh, Brother James to come up, up and Sister Selena, I want you to come up also. Um, <clears throat> it's an honor and a privilege to have y'all here this morning. Um, Brother James, uh, I've known him since he was a teenager. Him and my children uh, all ran together up at the hill. Uh, it used to be a church on the hill. It's called Covenant Church now. And uh, we all been through a lot of things. And God is just, I am just awesomely overwhelmed at what God has done. I mean, he has brought you so far. And he has made, God has... <laughs> anointed him and appointed him for such a time as this Hallelujah. and you know all the trials and the tribulations that we've gone through was for a time such as this <laughs> it said even when esther was in the book of esther when esther was stolen and taken to the the palace and she's probably thinking oh what in the world why about stolen and throwing in this but she did not know at that time there was an appointment and there's times that we go through things in life and we don't understand why we're going through it. We don't understand why this fight, why that fight, but we know that there's a reason for such a time as this. And uh, I bless you as a mother. I bless y'all as a mother. I give you a mother's blessing this morning. And we're so privileged that you're here. And Sister Slim, I want you to testify before your husband begins to preach with you and give it to him. I love y'all. Uh, I mean, I, I love y'all so much. Y'all are blessed my heart. Uh, you're just like my own kids. You know, I mean, I, I feel like I have a whole bunch of kids. But, you know, you you were raised around my kids. You know, you know y'all know my kids, and, and I see how God works. And, and, and if there's mothers watching and even mothers here, if you don't have kids that are safe, hang on. If you give them the word and you talk them the word, God is going to bring it around and he's gonna, it's gonna flourish for the time of for the time that it's gonna be. And that time. And I just praise God for y'all this morning. I'm gonna get out of the way and let God do what he wants to do. Thank you, Jesus. Get over here where they can see you. Good morning. I am so blessed to be here this morning. <laughs> they are family we love them so much and they have always been there for us when other people haven't they have always been here for us and we felt their prayers through the years i assure you um as sister vicky was uh singing this morning god spoke to me and he spoke on fire i could just feel that and hear his voice over and over again fire 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 and um i wrote down i jotted down real quick um, Jax, will you bring that to me real quick so I can make sure I remember everything that the Lord spoke to me? Thank you, buddy. And as I I kept hearing it, I went back there and I, I told Bubba, or James, I call him Bubba. I went back there and uh, I told him, I said, I kept hearing fire. And uh, a song that I know that Miss Vicky will know I just heard it over and over in my spirit. How did it let the fire fall, let the wind blow, let your glory yeah, come down? Yeah. I just kept feeling it. And it's the presence of God is so strong here this morning. Yeah. God is wanting to bring his fire down here. Yeah. And it's coming. It's yeah. here. Yeah. And uh, I went back there to tell him this. And he said, is it okay that I say it? Yeah. His message is on fire. And I had no clue. Amen. <laughs> so God is speaking. Confirmation. Amen. <laughs> But what a little thing that I want to share. God has brought us so far in the thing, and he's brought every one of y'all, I know, from something, and he's not done. That's what we can hold on to. He's not done. And, and he spoke to me, and then I'll give it to him. He, he spoke so clearly, and this is not just for me. It's for someone here that you don't have to be perfect. <laughs> and then he spoke to me personally. And this may be for someone else too. You've never been perfect. <laughs> and you don't ever have to be. But you have to do your best to stay in my will. And you so 
I don't know why I have the mindset of I always have to try to be perfect. Jesus is the only person that has ever been perfect. We just have to do our best to strive to be the best we can be. So uh, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. God was speaking to me this morning, and I will give it over to Bubba now. God is so good. I could feel the fire when I was born. I could feel it saying my whole body was just on fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Proud of you, sir. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Ain't he good? He is good. Oh, good. You get a couple things out of the way before we get into the word. Uh, first thing is it is such an honor to be at my spiritual mom and dad's church and getting to bring a word. Um, God has allowed me to do some great, great things, and I give him all the glory for that. Um there's a lot of ministers who, who will never get to baptize their, their wife or their kids or um, their siblings and things. Like that. And God allowed me to do that. And that was great in my life. And then, and then um, some of the things, and I'm going to give a little bit of my testimony uh, that I got to live through. Uh, most people would never get to live through those things. Um, and I give him all the glory, but then to get to come to my spiritual mom and dad's church and, um, to see their church growing one, but to also be able to bring a word um, at their church is a, uh, I told Brother Randy the other day on the phone, it's almost like uh, my spiritual bucket list. Um, you know, not everybody gets the opportunity to do that. And so it is such an honor and blessing to be here. Um, I absolutely love uh, Sister Vicki, Brother Randy. They played a massive massive role in my salvation and walking out uh where god has led us just over the years um after i got saved i went to work for brother randy at the tire shop he become a spiritual dad um then he fired me um and i was like man my my spiritual daddy's fired me then he hired me back then he fired me again um but through everything he was always there. Um, and I don't say this lightly. What y'all have in your pastors, other churches don't have. I, I get to preach it at a lot of other churches. Um, we've attended some other churches. And I've met some great pastors. But what y'all have in your pastors, a lot of churches don't have. Don't take that lightly. You've got a man and woman uh, leading y'all that are hungry and they taught me how to be hungry for the Lord um, next thing is the Lord showed me uh, something I'm going to share it and then I'm going to give my testimony we're going to get in the word I'm not going to keep you super long today um, I remember when I first started preaching uh, I could write 15 pages of notes and preach it in 3 minutes I was done. I, I, I could have the altar call sitting in my truck wondering where we're going to go eat lunch within 15 minutes. It. I, I, I told my wife, I said, I am not called to this because I like to study it, but I can't preach it. Now, I guess it just come with time. Now, I can have three pages of notes and preach two hours. I'd have about six pages of notes today so y'all don't get in a hurry. Um, God showed me something about the young lady in the green shirt god wants you do you journal he wants you to start doing it more Amen. god says you're going to move mountains with your journaling god says that through your journaling people will be saved souls will be set free from darkness through your journaling and that's what as i sat back there and i prayed and i was just seeking the lord that's what i felt the lord saying is that god is going to use you mightily with a pen and paper. Just your own personal notes between you and the Lord. He's going to use them. So, like they said, my name's James Kimbrell. I'm a, everybody calls me Bubba. A lot of people know my grandparents. 
Uh, my grandparents owned Trotter's Produce back before my grandfather shut down and it passed away, or it shut down after he passed away. Um, I was born and raised here. I absolutely love this town. When God, uh, when God moved me from this town, I didn't want to be moved. But he said, I need you to go to Nacogdoches. I said, oh, Lord, I don't, I don't like Nacogdoches. Uh, ain't nothing wrong with Nacogdoches, but I, I like Rusk. I like the little town. And so we go there. God moved in my life like never before, and I'm going to share that with you here in a second. But then God, after a year, moved us to Cushing. Like I said, I like the little town. So he moved it to Cushing, Texas, population two or three hundred, I'm not sure. And I said, Oh God, there's nothing here. Yeah. He kind of put me from one extreme to another. Right now we're in Cushing. God is moving in the church that um we attend. Yeah. I absolutely love the church we go to. I love the people there. Um, but I said, God, I said, why are you moving me around? It was, it was crazy because the Lord tells me, he said, I'm in a gas station. We're Things are going great at the church in Nacogdoches we were attending. And the Lord says, you're going to start going to Big Rock Gospel Church. I said, oh, Lord, you better tell Selena. Because um, she she's like me. We don't like change. Um, she's sitting in the car at the gas pump. I come out and I sit down in the car and she's, Ball in his ball, got makeup running down her face. I said, girl, what's wrong with you? She said, God just said we got to move to Big Rock. I didn't know if she was crying because she's happy that she heard God or she's crying because she's mad. But I said, well, okay, well, then uh, the Lord, okay, we're going to Big Rock. <laughs> God has moved there. Uh, we've seen some per a lot of personal revival there. Um, not just within ourselves, but within some of the members. We've seen an awakening there. And we're just praying for more. So you continue to pray for us. Um, I was, like I said, I was born and raised here. I'm just a jacked up kid. Uh, had a good family, but chose my own path. And at 27, 26, 27, I... Um, Gave my life to the Lord. Now, I went to church. I dated a girl. Uh, we were engaged to be married. I went to church. That's where I met uh, Miss Vicky was there. It's where I met uh, her kids. It's where I met Brother Randy. Matter of fact, I think y'all had only been married a month or two when I met y'all. Um, I'd met Randy at the tire shop, but I just kind of knew who he was. That was it. And um, I didn't know, you know, I never spent enough time with him to know that he was a man of God. Um, you look at Randy. Back then, he had the long ponytail, real thin little ponytail. You didn't see a man of God. Just like when people see me, they don't see a man of God unless I'm in long sleeves. Um, it's funny. I, I went to the hospital when my stepdad passed away. And, and uh, they said, you can't go in there because of all the COVID stuff, right? And he hadn't passed away at this moment. He, he was holding on, and we were trying to say our goodbyes. And they said, you can't go in there. And I was in a short sleeve shirt. It was a Christian shirt, but it was short sleeve. And um, my mama said, yeah, he can. My husband's, you know, doctor said any minute, he's coming to tell his stepdad about it. Can't go in there because of COVID violations and this and that. And those. But then my mama said, well, he's our pastor. I have my little card, you know. I'm a, I'm, I, I am an ordained minister. And immediately the woman said, she looked at my arms. I thought maybe something was on me. Oh, maybe there's a spider on me or something. And she said, you're a minister? I said, I am. She goes, oh, well, I can't stop you. But it was funny because the first thing she did was look at my arms. Yeah. You know, when I first started ministry, I had these big old gauges in my ear. I don't condone that. I don't condone tattoos. I don't condone any of that. But I'm just saying I had them at that time. And people, I would start talking about Jesus and people would look at me crazy. And uh, it was like, you have to look a certain way to follow Jesus. So what I want to tell you today is if you came to church looking for some big theological religious preacher um, that, that can speak all the different languages in these and those, I'm sorry, you're not getting it today, not with me. 
It may be a t- good TV show with it on, but I, I'm just not that guy. I'm a country boy that messed his life up, that without a God, I'm a nobody. Without the God, I'm nobody. I, without the Holy Spirit leading and guiding me, I am an idiot. My yep. wife will agree. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Hey, we are a mess. Come on. But because of Jesus, Amen. I'm able to stand here and talk to you today. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Vicky, she she's talked about trials. I want to just share a few things with you. Um, I, this is not in my notes. This is um, something totally different. As she was talking, I felt this in the Lord. And so uh, I'm going to share with you. Uh, you haven't done too much for God not to use you. Amen. I don't care how many times you've walked away from the Lord. Because I've done it. You may walk a thousand miles away from God, but it only takes one step to get back to Him, because He's always right there with you. See, I I I had a ministry at one time. I don't know if y'all heard of the Harvest House out on Highway sixty nine. Me and a buddy of mine started that ministry in two thousand fourteen. Um, absolutely loved that ministry. But because I wouldn't let go of some things in my life, some anger issues, some some uh, dad issues, I had to re- I had to relieve myself from the ministry. I had to walk away from it. But in in the middle of doing this ministry, we give everything to God. And this is this is the testimony. My testimony. We gave everything to the Lord. And I wound up getting heart disease. And I got so mad at God. And that's what caused me to fall away from the ministry. And for quite a few years, I would try to come to church. I try to get back on track. Uh, when, when Randy and Vicky first started Disciples Heart, we came a few times. The Holy Spirit moved on me like never before. But then I couldn't go nowhere. It was just, it was, um, and so I decided, well, the God thing just ain't for me. I, I'll say my prayer every night before I go to bed. My wife will bless this meal, or I'll bless the meal, and and you know if they want to continue going to church and doing all that, that's good. But I'm mad at God because I gave you everything, God. And now I'm here. I'm dying. Doctors give me a five year death sentence. I had a rare heart disease, and I want you to hear the word had. This is for, if you know anybody that's sick, this is for you. If you're sick, this is for you. I had a rare heart disease that they couldn't cure. There was only one doctor in the entire nation that ever even heard of this heart disease called Brin's Metal Angina. There's six of us in the United States at that time that had it. Um, don't have nothing to do with weight. Exercise has nothing to do with any of that. I was born with it, but I was 32 or 33 when it hit me. I was, I had a heart attack because of it. My heart was getting weak. Um, my kids were watching me suffer because that's what I was doing. But what Prince Metal, Prince, Prince Metal Angina is, it's where your, your arteries have seizures. And you go into a heart attack because it cuts the blood flow off. Doctors can't give you medicine for it. There's nothing they can do for it. And so I was mad. I said, God, I'm, I'm just going to kind of do my own thing. In order for them to quit asking me to go to church, I took a job to where it was a seven-day-a-week job. I, I wound up working on a uh, chicken farm as a maintenance supervisor, and I ran a few of the houses. And... I loved what I done. I love working. Now I don't have to go to church because I got to work. God, you understand? I got to work. That might be for someone in here too. Got to work. It might be someone on Facebook. I got to work. So God, you understand? I told Selena a few months before my accident. God is calling me. He's trying to talk to me, and I hear him. And we had some very in-depth conversations about it. But it's not for me no more. So one morning I get a phone call. And one of the uh, chicken houses had flooded. 
if you know this is East Texas, there's chicken houses all over East Texas. You know what's in the chicken house plus what the chickens leave in the chicken house. And then you add about three foot of water to that. It's not a good smell. Me and Selena go back there. The feeder line is not underwater yet, so I'm thinking I've got to get that before it goes underwater and electrocutes all these chickens. Our houses held 25,000 chickens in each house. So I reached down, I grabbed the line, and when I grabbed the feeder line, one of the wires fell in water. I was electrocuted for 10 minutes with 110 volts of electricity running through my body. Selena would try to kick it off of me. She couldn't. Every time she would try to kick it, it would grab a hold of her. Um, for 10 minutes, I laid screaming for help. She couldn't help me. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, go flip the breakers. You can't get him off. Go flip the breakers. And I was going in and out of consciousness. And I, I told her, I said, tell the ba my babies I love them. I, I knew I was going to die. Um, I could feel I could feel my heart giving out on me. It felt like my eyeballs were going to fall out of my head at any moment. It was horrible. Um, but I woke up. I went I, I went out and I looked up and she was nowhere to be found. And then I I said, God, I said, if you get me, all of a sudden I remember. Well, maybe I can at least get right with the Lord, and not burn in hell. I said, God, if you'll forgive me and you'll get me out of this. I'll do anything you ask me to do. I don't care what it is. And I don't care what it costs. I'll do it. And so I woke up. I passed back out from the pain. I woke up and I was rolling down a briar patch outside with no shirt on. Don't know where my shirt went. The chickens may have ate. The electricity may have blew it off. But I'm rolling down this briar patch. I ain't got no shirt on. I'm getting covered up with briars. But I noticed this hand from the elbow down to my fingertips was dead. I couldn't use it. And I had a little old burn on the inside of my finger. They carried me to the ER. Matter of fact, uh, the paramedics tells me when we get there, man, I'm sorry. It took us a little bit. They actually called life flight for you. Um, but when we heard it was 10 minutes, we said, well, he's dead. There's no reason to bring life flight. And so we took our time getting out there because we heard you were electrocuted for 10 minutes and we didn't hear nothing else. We figured we were coming out to a dead body. When they got there, I'm sitting on the back of a truck, madder than a hornet because I'm covered in chicken poo poo. They carried me to the ER. Doctor comes in and says, well, you got bit by electricity. You should be okay. And my wife said, no, he was he was electrocuted for 10 minutes. He said, you, you should be a dead man. I said, yeah, I should. He said, we're keeping you to run tests. I said, okay. Um, I still hadn't got no use of my arm. It took me a couple of days to get use, the use of my arm back from the electricity. But they'd done all the tests, and they couldn't find anything wrong at all. And so I said, okay, God. I promised you. What's it going to be? And God says, you're going to tell your boss you're going to start going to church. And so I, I went to my boss and said, we need Sundays off to go to church. She said, no, you ain't. Yes, I am. Um, in order for us to go to church, and I think God did this just to see how hungry I really was, we would get up at 2 in the morning and we'd have to go work the chicken houses from 2 in the morning till about 9.30. We would run in, take a shower. It was a 20-minute drive to church, and we'd be sitting in church by 10. Wow. It was crazy. Then we would run to the grocery store, grab a few groceries while we're in town. Then we'd come straight back and go right back to work. We did this for about four months, every Sunday. Um, but one Sunday... I was in church, and my daughter, who led me to the Lord, and I'm going to tell you that's where I started telling this story, and I got on something else. I, I, I rabbit trail a lot. Um, my daughter, who led me to the Lord, uh, had come to church with us, and she was running at the time, and I said, uh, you go, I'm, you're going to the altar with me. I'm going to lead you back to the Lord. I was running harder than she was. She was just following Daddy. We get her up there. I get her up there to the altar. I have to drag her. And I'm actually dragging myself. And guy walks up and he said, 
what do you need prayer for? I don't need prayer for nothing. She does. He goes, well, I, Jesus name, God use her. Da, da. What do you need prayer for? And I said, man, I don't told you. I don't need prayer for nothing. She does. She's running from the Lord. You know, it, you know, her sin's worse than mine. Yeah. Bible Belt America. <laughs> and so uh, he said, and I done prayed for her, and I don't care what her sin is, but you need prayer. I've had big healing ministers lay hands on me and not get healed. So just nonchalantly, I said, I got a heart disease. I'm going to die in about another year. Uh, you can pray if you want. I had done given up on the fact that I could be healed. And he prayed with me. And I walked out of that church and I said, Selena, I believe God healed me. Amen. Wow. That's Thank been Lord. two years ago. There's no sign of a heart disease ever. No sign of heart attacks, even though the top doctors in the United States have looked at my files and had seen it. Um, no sign of none of it. I hadn't been in the ER with my heart in two years and I was going once a week. Um, God is a healer. Everybody likes the salvation story, so I'll share it, and then we're going. I'm going to bring the word. I started it a while ago. Like I said, I met uh, Pastor Vicky and Brother Rand, Pastor Randy, and all of all of um, their kids. Uh, Jeremiah was closest to my age, and then Jessica was a year younger than him. Um, but I, I remember I went to a church on the hill. They had just transformed over from um, I think it was. First Pentecostal Church on the Hill or something to Church on the Hill. They had just, yeah, they just had transferred over. And um, I go to church there because I'm dating this girl and her parents are making me go to church if we're going to date. Um, I had other plans uh, for dating this girl. They were not holy. Um, and then, but I remember... Jessica, and I, I've got to share this with Jessica so many times. She was, and I, I never can remember the song, but she was singing his song, and his song rocked me. And um, 10 years goes by, I run into him at Brookshire's. I see him here, see him there. No, no, you know, not really getting to hang out much. But 10 years goes by, and my best friend, Martin, says, hey, I want you to come to church. He had already got my wife and Micah going a couple times, so I went. And um, I promised Micah, my daughter, she's 20 now, I promised her that I'd go. And I walk into the church, and Jessica's on the platform. This is at the River of Life. She's on the platform. And I said, where's Jessica there? I didn't know y'all were going to that church. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that church was a school. Uh, didn't know any of that. I knew it used to be no hospital, and it was kind of creepy. Um, and so we we walk in, and I can show you the exact spot that this took place because I'll never forget it. It's when God hit me. But we walk into the church, and I see Jessica, and just under my breath, I said, God, if you're real, and if you're as mighty as they say you are, and you really want a drug addict, alcoholic piece of trash like me that his own mom and daddy i didn't i, I felt like my mom and daddy didn't want but if if you really want something like that that girl up on that platform was singing that song for the end of the service i take about two steps like i said, I said this under my breath nobody could hear me and she tells the worship leader she wasn't the worship leader but she tells the worship leader, hold on a minute the Lord said, we got to sing this song right now. She started cool. singing that song. Uh, right then. Boom. Uh, I hit my knees. Holy Spirit fell on me. My, my six-year-old daughter laid hands on me. She told me about Jesus, how much Jesus loved me. She led me to the Lord. That's been 14 years ago. It hasn't been easy. But it has been worth it. So, if you would say this prayer with me, Father God, open my heart and clear my mind so that I can receive your word and apply it to my life. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So there was this pastor one time that um, he went, he was making his rounds and he was going to the, uh, you know, checking on people who hadn't been to church in a while. And he gets, stops at this late, older lady's house and she invites him in and they're, they're visiting and talking. And um, she has a bowl of peanuts sitting on the coffee table. And he said, do you mind if I, I eat a couple of those peanuts? She says, no, not at all. Go right ahead, Pastor. Well, they sit there and talk, and before he realized it, he had eaten his whole bowl of peanuts. And he tells her, he says, Sister, I'm so, so sorry. I have sit here and eat every one of those peanuts. She said, don't worry about it, Pastor. She said, all I do is to eat the chocolate off of them, but because my, I don't have many teeth, I spit the peanuts into that bowl. Amen. <laughs> Looks can be deceiving, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And, and there's part of my message that talks about fire. Um, so I want to ask you today, church, are you salt or are you a salt substitute? See, back in the Bible days, salt was used for so many things. But one of the very main things it was used for was to preserve food. They didn't have ice boxes then. So their meat would rot and decay really quick. Would you agree with me this morning if I said we're living in a world that is lost, and dying, and decaying right in front of our eyes? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So are you the salt that's helping preserve it? Or are you the substitute that's just walking around in it looking pretty? You may be thinking, how am I going to change things? I'm only one person. You may be saying to yourself, what, you know, what can I do about that, preacher? And I'm going to share with you what I did with it here in a little bit. But see, salt was a high commodity back then also. A lot of times, your Roman soldiers, they were paid with salt. They would, instead of giving them money, the Roman soldiers would be paid with salt because it was very valuable back then. These days, we, of course, use salt to flavor our food. But we also can use it for many other things. You can take a coffee pot that the coffee burnt in the bottom, or a pan where food is getting stuck in it real bad, you can throw your little salt in there with some water, slosh it around, wipe it out. You can take coffee grounds, and if the coffee's a little bitter, drop you just a little bit of salt in there, and it'll take the bitterness out of the coffee. So I ask you, church, are you salt? Because substitute can't do none of that. It's just going to make it taste fun. So are you salt? Can you clean? The dirty? Amen. Can you make the bitter go away? Because let's face it, church, the church today, we're looked at as bitter people. Because we don't like homosexuals. We don't like murderers. We don't like rapists. But I'm going to tell you, we don't like them. We love them. Right. And people, oh my God, I, I, I've said this at a church before and I thought that's going to spear me or something. There. What? You love homosexuals? I love them to death and life. Mainly life. My yeah, wife gets mad at me and say love the death. She says, don't say that. And so I don't love their sin. I don't know. I don't condone in what they're doing. But their sin ain't no different than me. That, that, that sin they're doing is no different than when I was putting drugs in my mind. That sin that they are doing is no different than me telling a lie. Or me getting a piece of gum that wasn't mine as a kid. See, the difference is I repented. I turned away. That sin's no different than having that drink of whiskey at night, that beer at night, that marijuana at night. Well, I'm old enough. So I'm legal. Well, I'm sorry. The Bible says if you it alters your thinking, it is a sin against God. So it's no different. But see, we, we live in this world to where we become substitute. We, we, we become Mrs. Dash. 
because it's easier to not wipe the dirty away or take the bitterness away. Then it's easier to add to it and it tastes good to cover it up. Yeah. See, it's so much easier. We had pastors today, the big name ministers. It breaks my heart. They get on they get on these TV shows and they'll say, Well, how do you feel about abortion? Well, last week you preached about it and you hated it, but now that you're in front of a million people that probably half of them send a check to you, you well, uh, 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 to, to, to each his own, and they stutter over their words, and they become a substitute right then. Luke 14, 34. And you can just write this one down if you want to. Luke 14, 34, it says, Now salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soul or for the manure pile. They throw it out. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. See, when you become that substitute to God, just like when God tells you if you're cold, if you, if you, you, you to, you know, be hot or cold, but don't be lukewarm. Because if you're lukewarm, you just like vomit coming out of his mouth. And so what God is saying, Jesus is saying in Luke is, if, if if you become that salt substitute, you ain't even good for the manure pile. You ain't even good enough to throw in the poop. I've been in chicken poop. You ain't even good enough to be in that. See, I was that lukewarm Christian. Turn with me to Matthew 5, verse 13 through 16. This is our uh, text for the day. Matthew 5, verse 13 through 16. While you're turning there, I'll share something with you. I like to I like to give everybody time to get to where I'm at. Um, I remember uh, many times the pastor would say, "Turn with me here," and I'm trying to flip there, and he starts reading, and then he's already on the third scripture, and I'm still looking for the first one, and I'm having to bother people saying, "What's that next one again?" And so, and I would get discouraged. Um, and then I went to ministry school, and we did Bible drills. And so I got a little bit familiar where I could catch up. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. But I like to give people time. Um, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And I know most of you are already there. What I was going to ask you to do is pray for my daughter. In about three weeks, I'm going to be a grandpa. I am so super excited. I know this is not holy, but like I said, if you were looking for her, for, for theolo theology and all that, you probably came to the wrong place today. Um, I done warned her that if that baby comes out as cute as them 3D pictures is, I'm going to knock her in the head, karate chop right to the neck, and get, take that baby. It's a boy, so God, that baby ain't even born yet and got Paul wrapped around his finger. I cannot wait. I can't wait. I done prayed, Lord, let that baby cry so much that she says, I need a break, and brings it to me. And so, <laughs> no, she's going to be a good mama, and I'm super proud of my daughter. I love her dearly. We, she got to go spend the last three days. We've been on vacation for the last three days. Um, and it was to get away and do some fishing, get ready for this word. Um, I will confess it wasn't as much getting ready for the word as I wanted it to be. We did have a good time. I was able to pray. Uh, this was a word that God gave me. Matter of fact, God gave me this word the same day that Brother Randy asked me if I'd like to come minister here. And so I knew then, and I told Randy over the phone, I was like, man, I got two words. And he said, God's going to give you a different. Yeah. I said, he probably will. That's the way it usually works. <laughs> um, I got up this morning, and all through the few days we've been on vacation, I would flip through the Bible and, okay, Lord, speak to me. And he was like, man, I already told you what I want you to talk about. So I was like, all right, good deal. I'm going to go fishing. So Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. 
You're the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. I want to ask you, did you notice in the scripture that he didn't say, nowhere in there did Jesus say, you're the salt of the shaker. He didn't say that. He said, you're the salt of the earth. See, salt is useless if it's left in the shaker. You as a man and woman of God, I'm going to step on some toes, are useless if you ain't the man and woman of God outside these doors here. See, it's easy. It's easy to, to sit in the church on the pew, and it's easy to, do, to, to sing the worship songs. It's easy to raise your hands and praise God. It's easy to say your prayers at night. But do you show Jesus when you're out there in the world where it's hard. Right. You know, I said earlier, I would share with you how only one person can change things. But first, see, God, go. Jesus goes on to describe us as a light of the world. But what he was doing was he's giving us great responsibility. Because he claimed that title for himself. And we're supposed to be like him. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 9, 5 says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus didn't challenge us to be the salt or the light. He simply said we are. He didn't say, I want you to go out and be the salt. I want you to go out and be a light. He just simply said you are that. If you're my children, if you're my disciples, if you have my father in your heart and now he's your father, then you therefore are the salt and light of the world. Not you're going to be, not you might be, not that you was. You are. So with that, you're either fulfilling it or you're failing at that responsibility. See, Jesus didn't just die a sinner's death on the cross for you to be a private Christian. Amen. Nowhere in the Word does it say we're supposed to be some kind of covert secret agent Christian. We must be public with our love for the Lord. Like one pastor once said, you, when God comes in your heart, you should become a billboard for Jesus. Amen. I'm guilty of not being that at times. We do live in a crazy world. People do make me mad. Come on. <laughs> yes. Plus, Selena's got me on this diet plan. It's working, so praise God. But I also... I'm a pit master on a barbecue trailer. And so I'm angry anyway because I smell barbecue all day and I smell like barbecue all day and I got to eat some little old bar. Oh, man. <laughs> and then people come up and they tell me, that barbecue didn't taste right. Well, your taster's messed up. I know it tastes right, even though I hadn't eaten none of it. I know it. I don't cook bad briskets. But see, we serve a God it redeems. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Are you the light among your family and friends? When you go to work it, it, every day or you go to the gym or go to the grocery store or, or go to the coffee shop, are you the light of Jesus? Yes. Are you the light in your community? See, we have to let our light shine. D.L. Moody once said, we are told to let our light shine, and if it does, 
We won't need to tell anybody it does. Light, lighthouses don't fire cannons to call attention to their shining. They just shine. <laughs> Francis of Assisi said, all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light a, of a single candle. That's right. I want to do something real quick if we can cut off all the lights. I know we're going to have a little bit of light through that window. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ms. There we go. Now I need a light to see what I was going to say. Okay, it, it's it, it's fairly dark. We have a little light, but it is fairly dark. But if we're the light that Jesus called us to be, then we can light up the world. Amen. With this little bit of light, and it's not a whole lot of light, I actually have done this this part before but i had matches but we're going to use this light with this little bit of light y'all can see me y'all can make out that there's a big guy up here with a microphone he's talking all right but then flip just that light on back there for me now this gentleman now is on fire for god his lights on so that brings more that brings more light to the to the world. Amen. All right. Then we we'll flip this one on. Wait. Don't have to. Don't be the one behind us. All right. He's trying to find us. Then we flip that one on. There's more light. So what can one person do? I'm sorry, Miss Vicky. I hate you do all that. Oh, you're fine. We'll work with her. <laughs> Like that light that I was holding, like these lights, we have to be turned on. We have to burn to get rid of the darkness around us. If you take that light and you just sit it in a dark room, you still have nothing but a dark room. How many Christians today are like the turned off light or the unlit candle? And they say a prayer. They invite Jesus in their heart. They sit in a pew or in a chair in, they, in, in the church building, and that's what they do the rest of their life. You can say, well, at least I was in church. Yeah, you're right. At least you got your fire insurance. At least you're going to get to go to heaven and stand on the pearly gates, and you're going to get to worship Jesus. Yeah. Praise God. <laughs> but God didn't call you just to sit on a pew. He didn't send His Son to be beaten. He didn't send his son to hang on a cross to suffocate and die. That those of you that don't know, when you when you hang him, the way he was hanging, all right, all your weight bears down on your lungs, and that's what you suffocate. He didn't do all that just for you to sit in a in a church. Now I'm not saying don't come to church. No, you need to be in church. You need to be a, get with uh, amongst the believers. You need to be with your church family. Because I'm going to tell you now, church, without my church family, I wouldn't have lived through being electrocuted. Without my church family, I wouldn't have lived. I'd be dead. I wouldn't have lived through a heart disease. Without my church family praying for me two years ago when they said, you got cirrhosis of the liver, you're going to die. After all these other death sentences, they say, you got cirrhosis of the liver, you're going to die. And, and, and what did I do? I called my wife. And she called church family. And the very next week I go back because they want to start me on some treatments. The very next week, he says, I don't know what happened, but here's your liver. Here was your liver. We messed up. No, you didn't mess up. I believe you're a great doctor. But see, I serve a God that's bigger than you. Come on. Amen. 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 Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. He, is good. Thank he didn't you. die to just sit on that pew in that chair. Yep. He called you to be his disciple. Thank you, Jesus. The Easton's Bible Dictionary describes the disciple of Christ as one believes his doctrine. Yes. 
Two, rests on his sacrifice. Three, imbibes in his spirit. And four, imitates his example. Ooh, that's good. See, church, we got the first three down. As men and women of God, we can do those for We believe in the doctrine. We believe what this Bible says because we got it in our heart. We believe in the sacrifice that God sent with his son. And we rest in the Holy Spirit. But then we take that forth and the imitates in his example. And he says, oh, the, you, the church has asked Pastor Randy, Pastor, Pastor Vicky's job. Uh, that evangelist that came the other day, that's his job. Um, that's not for us. That fourth one is for other people. But see, Mark 16, 15 through 8 says, Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. If they should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. Then you got Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and I'm going to use the Passion Translation. I know Brother Randy loves the Passion Translation, so do I. So I'm going to use that one. It's, then Jesus came close to them and said, All the authority of the universe has been given to me. Now go into go in my authority and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to f faithfully follow all that I have commanded you. And never forget, I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Did, did, maybe, maybe I skipped that part. Maybe your Bible has a different translation. Nowhere in there does it say, go to church and sit there, listen, take a few notes. It says, go out. Nowhere does it say it's just okay to get fire insurance. I said this once in the church, and the church never invited me back. So if I never get to come back here, I know this is why. Nowhere in the scripture does it tell us to sit and get fat. While we're living in a world that is dying. They're starving to death. See, friends, Jesus is the bread of life. And if we have Jesus, then we have the means to feed the lost. But instead, we want to hoard it up. Like the Israelites, when they got, they, they got scared, the Israelites got scared, manna falling from heaven. The, 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 the only rule they had about that was, you get enough for today. Don't hoard it up. You get enough for today. And see, Christians in church, we, that's what we do. We, 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 get, we don't get enough for today. We want to hoard all the bread of life up. And we want to hold on to it. And what happens is it sours in us because we forget, because we overload our brain. What happens at work when they give you a lot of instructions, it overloads your brain. That's why they make manuals. And so this is our manual where we don't overload our brain. But we want to hoard that up. We don't want to feed the lost because then we might get hungry. Here's the fiery part that I was mean. I was telling Selena I was preaching on. <clears throat> Hebrews 1 7 says he makes his servants a fiery flame. And then in, again in Psalms 104 4 says God makes the wind his messengers flames of fire on his servants. Are you a flame of fire? I shared earlier, I said earlier that I'll share with you how one person can make a difference. God called me to do crazy things that most people wouldn't do. I'm not mad because I said a prayer one time. I got saved and Christianity was very boring to me. I did not like the Christian lifestyle. Uh, you got to understand, I was uh, abusing prescription pills, and I was drinking a lot. I still partied, um, and now all of a sudden I'm saved, and the Bible says don't do those things because they alter your thinking, and so I quit doing them. And then I was bored, out of my mind. 
I did not like the Christian lifestyle. And I turned on TV and I watched this man. He was, I just flipped the agenda. This man was screaming and hollering. I said, man, what is wrong with that guy? Got dreadlocks, he's tatted up. And, you know, I got tattoos, so I was like, okay. Well, what caught my eye was the way he was screaming and hollering. But then in the back, it said, Jesus. Let me see what this idiot's hollering about. Because this, <laughs> I thought maybe we had some snake church. I watched him and I said, Lord. I want that kind of fire. I did not know that about what four, five years later, that man would baptize me in the water with a, a couple other people, um, and then it actually prophesied to the town that we were praying that we were going to because we God had told me and Selena on different occasions that we were going to go to a place called Roaring Spring and be youth pastors there. But we hadn't shared this with nobody. We had just shared it with each other, and then he tells the youth pastor that took us on this trip. He, that their friends, he said, there's a new fire coming to Roaring Springs. And so the youth pastor looks at us and said, you know, he's talking about y'all, right? I said, man, I don't want to take your job, but we're praying that God does something. Yeah. God moved up there. Went from five, six teenagers every, every Wednesday night to running 40s, 50s, 60s, seeing whole schools, you know, meet at the prayer at, you know, up there, we met every week and we prayed around the flagpole. It wasn't one day a year. Uh, the schools, you know, and I give God all the glory. Please understand that. I tell you this to build your hope and your faith. Uh, but but the schools wanted us to actually come in and start fellowshipping with the students and eating lunch with them because they had seen a change in their students. When rival football teams come together at a church and they're all kin, they're like Ruskin out there. They're all family, but they'll beat up each other in a heartbeat. Well, that's why uh, Matt, uh, Patton Springs and Matador was, and uh, they come to church together to hear one of the youth bring a word that night, and the entire, which they play six-man football, but that doesn't matter, the entire football team gets saved. Oh, so that's kind of God I serve. Amen. Amen. But see, I've got, I've got, I've got to um, be in some very wild situations. With people where I show up at a drug house not knowing that the guy I'm with uh, has a $10,000 hit on his head by this drug dealer. We show up there in a car that had brought the transmission, it went out and it only had first gear down a dirt road that was about 10 miles long. Um, yes. We pull up in this house, I promise you, if you watch uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre ever in your life, that house looked kind of like this house. It was scary in its own. Um, yeah. saying, oh, Lord, there's only one way in, one way out. I, uh, we pull up, and I said, whoa. He said, man, I needed to tell you before we got here, but I just thought about it. I said, what's up? He goes, they're probably going to kill us. I said, no. He said, they got a $10,000 hit on my head. I said, brother, if I'd have known that, I'd brought you head. <laughs> and I said, what are we doing here? He said, he he, he worked in uh, the trafficking business and not tickets. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to go get one of my girls. I want to show her what Jesus has done for me. She's also pregnant and they're abusing her. So let's go. Step out of the car. And these guys come to the front door, which there ain't even a front door, but they walk out what used to be the front door. And they had the big gas mask on, like a chemical style gas mask. And they had assault rifles in their hands. I said, Oh, Jesus. Here we go. <laughs> I said, We're going to die. And he tells them, Man, you know who you're running with? I got a $10,000 hit on his head. Now I don't have to pay nobody. He said, But I'm going to kill you too. I said, Yes, sir. Well, my buddy who's supposed to be righteously saved. Start talking about, why don't you come down here and throw down to me? I'm like, man, they got guns. Shut your mouth. So I just, I, I don't know what else to do. I'm prepared to fight. I mean, I'm not a punk. I'm going to fight if I have to. I said, man, I just want to pray for everybody. Can we do that? That guy stepped back and took his mask off, and he said, dude, I don't know what, what's wrong with you, but you got five minutes to get the girl and get out of here. Amen. Easy enough. Except my bud and this girl, they want to reminisce standing outside the car. They want to sit and talk about, oh, do you remember so? And I'm like, look, time's ticking, man. It's fixing to get crazy. 
they're standing there with loaded guns and they're telling us time is ticking. And here we are wanting to talk. She's going with us. Finally, I thought to him, I said, y'all can die if you want to, but I'm getting in this car. It only has first gear. I can't get off this property as it is in another minute. Um, glory to God. Hallelujah. Soul slave. We go to the next house, and he said, this in here won't be as crazy, I promise, because I'm still breathing hard. My blood pressure is sky high. No wonder I got a heart disease. I'm the whole Jesus. We go to this next one, and... When we, we go to this next one here, and I knock on the door, and I'm in a suit because I went to court with a guy trying to get him in a halfway house, into the harvest house. And I knock on the door, and the woman walks up, and she puts a 45 to my head. Still got the needle in her arm. She said, you're the cops. No, ma'am, I run from them just like you do. <laughs> she said, I know you're the cops. Well, my buddy talked her down and everything, and... Uh, it wasn't the first time I'd had a gun pulled on me, but there was still there. There was fear there because she was prepared to shoot. And and we wound up praying with her. The outcome we wanted didn't happen. She decided that the, that life was better for her. Uh, we continued to pray and hope God moves in her life. Um, once again, all the glory to God that he let me do this. Because I did say a silly prayer. God, don't let me have a born Christian life. Well, I didn't know I was going to be kicking crackhead doors down. I didn't know I was going to be dealing with troubled teenagers. I didn't know that last week we, me and some buddies go out. You know, there was a, a murder out in uh, Nacogdoches in the hood uh, two Saturdays ago. Um, wasn't an accidental thing. They pulled up, shot four of them, one of them died. We decided... We're going to go pray for families and just walk up and down that street praying for God to move. This is where one person can make a change. While we're there praying, shots fire off in the back, probably from here to the highway from us. They're shooting at each other again. Um, don't get me wrong, it, it shook me. My wife and son had already prayed and said, we don't want you to go, something crazy is going to happen. But see, when I, when, when I gave my life to Jesus, that's what I did. I gave my life. And if my light has to shine in the hood while getting shot at to lead someone to Jesus, then let it shine. And as we're praying for this woman, she gives her life. And that was her friend that got killed. And she has so much hatred in her, and she's hoping that these boys can bond out just where her brother and her son can go kill them. And this is what she's telling us. And we, we pray with her and she falls in love with Jesus again. And she said, can y'all please help me change this community? I said, how? She said, use my yard. Let's start doing Bible studies every Tuesday night to start out. And then we're going to go bigger than that. Okay. This is a woman that hated God all of a sudden. This is a woman that was very angry. This was a woman saying, God, why don't you take my best friend? And I can't please let them bond out where we can kill them. And now we're doing Bible study in her yard this Tuesday night. Okay. So oh, much so God. that she's ordering 20 pizzas to feed the community and just to where she can help do this. See, one person can be that light where it makes the darkness flee. Now we got another person that's being a light. We're praying that because of her life, her son and her boyfriend and all them will now become light. Well, so what happens when you turn on all the lights in the dark? There's no more dark. So church, I challenge you today and I'm closing with this. Are you salt or are you a salt substitute? Are you an artificial light or are you the light of God? See, choosing this lifestyle is not easy. All of my troubles didn't go away. Um, I still had consequences to some things I'd done. But choosing this lifestyle is the best thing i ever done in my life.
like the rich young ruler, I didn't want to give everything away. I'd done everything you told me to do, God, but I, I, I didn't want to give up my pride. I didn't want to give up my reputation. Even though I wasn't living in my reputation no more, I, I had a pretty good reputation of partying and cutting up. and I didn't live that life, but I didn't want to give that reputation up. Instead, I was wanting to build on it. You know, there's Bubba the partier. Now look at him, Bubba the preacher. But I didn't want it to be in a godly way, right? Uh, are you hearing me, church? I wanted it to be a, oh, look at Bubba. Not look at the God that Bubba serves, but look at Bubba. Yeah. And I so much wanted my mom to say, look at my son. But not because of the son of God, but because of me. Yeah. Am I the only one that's ever felt that way? Yeah. But see, but then I got a hold of the real light. Yep. And then I realized it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the Jesus in us. There's a song. I listen to Christian rap. My ambitions is to be a Christian rapper one day. Amen. Come on. Don't know why. I love it. It's good stuff. Big old country Christian rapper. Come on. If that's what it takes to lead to preach the gospel, I'll do it. Yeah. Amen. Um, I'll stand on my head if that's what it takes. To, please don't ask me to. But I will. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for one soul. Because see, at one time, church, I was that hundred sheep. Yeah. And I served to Jesus that no matter how many times I took his name in vain, now, how many times I did things, things embarrassing, he still come back. Yep. The word today, I hope, encouraged you to not just sit in a pew. You may not like a certain group of people. You may not condone certain group of people and what they're doing but we have to love them and somebody has to share Jesus with them Father God Lord I just thank you I thank you God for a fresh fire on Disciples Heart Church Father I thank you for Pastor Vicky, Vicky and Pastor Randy Father I thank you for what you're doing in this church and in their lives. Father, now I ask you, Lord God, just to touch the church's heart, Father. Each and every person in here today, I ask you to touch their heart, Father. With every head bowed, every eye closed, and I normally don't do altar call like this, uh, I'm just going to be led by the Spirit and see what happens. Ms. Vicky, if you want to play something, do you mind? With every head bowed and every eye closed would you raise your hand if you if I said I hadn't done everything that God called me to do if God has spoke that to you gave you a dream a promise and you have not fulfilled it would you raise your hand Thank you. I see your hands raised. Father God, Lord, I ask you, Father, to move in their lives, Father, to give them direction, Father God. Lord God, to move in a way, Lord, that they will know it's you and only you. For those of you that raised your hand, I want to I want to just share something real quick. Will you keep your heads down and eyes closed, please? But I'm going to share something with you. Um, and this is what I feel in the Holy Spirit. One of you that raised your hand, you say, well, I'm praying. I'm praying about it. I'm praying about it. God is, I'm praying that God will do this. And I'm praying that, that, that God's going to move like this. And I'm praying that God tells me to go because he's given me the dream, the vision, but he hasn't said go yet. Well, I'm going to tell you, church, he has said go. In the Gospels, he tells them to go out. Amen. Go out. <laughs> See, we can see it. 
and we can pray, God, send me. God, send me. God, I'm re- I'm a- here I am, Lord, send me. See, Isaiah, he prayed, Lord, here am I. Send me, I'll go. But then he went. He didn't just stay there and pray that. The next thing I'm going to ask is if you need a fresh fire from the Lord, I'm going to ask you to stand up. God wants to move today in a mighty, mighty way. But see, if you want this fresh fire, you got to do something with it. I believe we're living in a time where God is tired of giving people fresh fires just to watch them burn out. How do you keep a fire fresh? You keep putting wood on the fire. How do you keep the flames burning hot? You put wood on the fire. See, if I throw a brisket in a in a cooker and I and, and I only put two sticks of wood in there, what do you have? You don't have a brisket that is edible. That's what you have. But if I continue to put wood on the fire and then I burn the impurities out of the brisket and I cook the brisket, then it's it, it's fit to eat. And so God is getting you ready, church, to do the same thing. God is getting you ready, church, to, for a fresh fire, Lord. Father, pour it out on Jesus, Lord God. But as you as you pour the fire out, Father, I pray that they activate it, that they activate this fire. Holy Spirit, I pray that you come into each and every one of their lives and that every step they step, all they can think about is souls. Jonathan Edwards, the guy that led the first great awakening, as he prayed riding his horse, he prayed, God, stamp eternity onto my eyes. So, Father, I pray step eternity on our eyes, but also on our heart, Jesus. That everywhere we go, Father, we see lost souls, Father. Everywhere we go, Father, we see people that are hungry. And, Lord, I pray, Lord God, that in this hunger, Lord, that we will share the bread of life. You know, the Lord is saying you don't have to be perfect, just like Selena said. You don't ha- you're do not you never going to be perfect until the day that he brings us home. But you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have this giant biblical knowledge. You don't have to say thee and thou. I remember the first time I prayed for a guy, he was a hipster type guy like myself. And I prayed and I said, I called God, dude. And the guy next to me after the prayer said, I don't think you can do that. I said, but God is my best friend. I called my best friend's brother and dude. And do you know that this young man said, you can talk to God like that? And I said, you talk to God like you would your best friend without the cussing. (laughs) And he said, oh man. And he gave his life to the Lord. Praise God. And so, You don't have to know scripture. You don't have to memorize scripture. Ask me how many scriptures I have memorized and I can tell you I can count them on my hands. Is that something I'm embarrassed of? Not really. But God shares scripture with me when I need it in the time of need. Father, I ask you to move. Move. Move, Father. Holy Ghost fire each and every person in here, Father God. Lord, you see them standing, Lord God. Lord, you see them ready to do what you have called them to do, Father. Now, Father God, I send them out. Father, I thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.